It is still early days, but this is unprecedented. A vaccine against the worst pandemic for a century has passed yet another phase. It is safe, the researchers at Oxford University announced today, and has induced an immune reaction. The new results are very encouraging. What, what it shows is that the vaccine and both is very well tolerated, exactly as we'd expect with this type of vaccine, very, very similar safety profile to previous vaccines of this type. And perhaps really importantly, we're seeing exactly the right type of immune responses, uh, which we were hoping to see, both neutralizing antibodies and the type of white blood cell, T cell, which we think will be important in protection. Vaccines can take years to develop. The speed even to this point of phase one and early phase two clinical trial is astonishing. 1,077 healthy adults were given either the vaccine against SARS-CoV-2, the virus that causes COVID-19, or they were given a meningitis vaccine. By day 56, the scientists could see strong antibody and T-cell immune responses. That is the body fighting back against COVID on two levels. I think this is a really important step on the way because it, it does show that we're making exactly the right sort of immune responses. But we still have to get one further step forward, which is to prove that the vaccine actually protects people. Because at the moment, we don't know what level of immune response we need for protection. A smaller group of just 10 volunteers was given a second dose and it produced an even stronger immune response, which could mean a two dose vaccination. Aid Thomas is taking part in the trial, although he doesn't know if he's been given the actual vaccine. The trial is speeding up in its process and I might find out sooner rather than later. Given the range of options, I would prefer the vaccine to work and I would be, um, I'd prefer it if I was in the vaccine trial grouping and um, not the meningitis control group. What the researchers still need to know is how well it works in older people and how long the immune response lasts. There are at least 23 vaccines in development. Chinese researchers also publishing in The Lancet today revealed positive results. And today the UK government announced that it has bought early access to 90 million vaccine doses from different companies, even with the understanding they may fail. I think we need to be very realistic about the position we're in. We have never anywhere in the world developed a vaccine against any coronavirus. And these coronaviruses we know very little about. We know a lot about malaria, we know a lot about HIV, and yet we still don't have vaccines for those. So we have to start from a position which is this is a heroic challenge. Um, to actually develop vaccines against this novel virus. And most of, of the attempts that are, are underway are likely to fail. The Oxford team are slightly more upbeat. Today has certainly given them a boost. And they say there may be, just maybe, a vaccine by the end of the year. Although probably people who are higher risk will be first in line. Well, earlier I spoke to Professor Sarah Gilbert, head of the team working on that vaccine at Oxford, whose trial has been described as promising. I began by asking what exactly this means in scientific terms. Well, for this vaccine, what it means is that um, in the first clinical trials where we start to immunise people and look at the, the reactions to the vaccine and the immune response to the vaccine, we're seeing exactly what we expected. So we didn't have any unpleasant surprises. Um, we saw what we've seen in similar trials that we've done previously and we're seeing good immune responses which is just what we expected to see. So where does that leave us now? What next? So what next is we're expanding the trials. This trial was done in healthy adults between the age of 18 to 55 and that's not the population that's most at risk of severe disease from this particular virus. We really need to know how the vaccine works in older people as well. So the trials that are running now are to immunise people in older age groups, either between the age of 56 and 69 or over the age of 70. Because we know that for most vaccines, the immune responses in older people aren't as good. So we're stuck with trying to have a population to vaccinate that we really need to protect, but they're not necessarily able to make such strong responses to vaccination. So we have to understand that better in order to know how this vaccine might best be used. Now, we know that the government has already signed a deal for 100 million doses of what's called the Oxford University vaccine, but also 90 million doses of a different vaccine. And yet there are no guarantees either of them will work. Just in practical terms, explain why the government is working in this way. 
Well, it's always a good idea to have more than one iron in the fire, uh, and we don't know what we need to achieve in terms of immune response to get protection against coronaviruses. And there are many challenges to be overcome to manufacture the very large numbers of doses that we need. So I would say it's a good strategy to have multiple shots on goal, multiple different technologies being evaluated uh, and potentially being used in the future. We hope they all work. Uh, we're going to need more than one vaccine to work to protect the whole world because no one vaccine will be manufactured in sufficient quantities to be used on its own. So um, it's a good strategy for the UK government to be investing in more than one. Now, we know scientists across the world are looking for a vaccine. Do you feel that you're part of a race or is this genuinely a collaborative effort? It is a collaborative effort. We're really racing against the virus, not against each other. We will be um, collaborating much more than would normally happen in vaccine development. We're all trying to do the same thing at the same time. And at the moment, none of us know how strong an immune response we need to aim for to get protection. But as soon as one vaccine gets that result, that will tell us a lot that will help all the other vaccine developers to understand if their vaccine is likely to be successful as well. The speed of this fight for this vaccine is extraordinary. It's been unprecedented. What is that like, working on a project like this at the moment, just in terms of the pressure? Well, what's been happening with us is we're all doing things that we've done before, but we're doing them in parallel instead of in series. So whereas we would normally be planning a phase one trial and then conducting the trial and analysing the results and writing up the results and then thinking about moving into phase two, this time phase one started a month before phase two started and then phase three started the following day. So um, it's all work that's familiar to us, but what we're not used to doing is doing everything at the same time. And that's been quite challenging to make sure that we've got everything on track, ready to keep all of the phases of the trials running. And of course, scientists are always urging caution. They tend not to be overjoyed by any particular development too soon. But I wonder, when this trial got to this stage, what did that feel like for you and your team? Well, I, it's probably a big relief as much as anything. As I said, this is what we were expecting to see, and we're pleased that we are seeing it, and it means that we carry on and that we're right to carry on and to get into the phase three trials and expand into multiple countries. So, um, it's not an unexpected success. It's uh, an expected development. We, we're seeing the results that we always thought that we would see. And the Prime Minister today was himself urging caution, very much saying we're not there yet, saying we might not even have a vaccine by next year. Is that the sort of timetable you're all, you share? The timetable is, is very, very difficult to be clear on. Um, we need to show vaccine efficacy, and that will require... Um, people in the trials who have the control vaccine to become infected and we just can't predict how long that's going to take. We need the manufacturing to move to the level where we can be making millions of doses at a time uh, and then we need the regulators to, to take a view on whether these vaccines should be used and that's something we have no control over. So we're concentrating on the parts that we can do uh, and we can't control the timing. Professor Gilbert, thanks very much for talking to us this evening. Now, according to Public Health England, the number of UK coronavirus deaths has risen by 11 in the last 24 hours to a total of 45,312, while there have been no new deaths recorded in Scotland, Northern Ireland or Wales. The number of confirmed COVID cases in the UK remains low, but there continues to be local spikes. The one causing most concern at the moment is in Blackburn. Victoria is in the newsroom now. Victoria, what can you tell us? Yes, well, the number of cases in the past week in Blackburn have doubled, uh, which has put it above Leicester, although nowhere near what Leicester was at its peak. Uh, and what they're saying in Blackburn is that they very much don't want to have to do a full lockdown. They really want to avoid that. They are having to take extra steps. Now, there is an irony. Let's just going back to the vaccine trial that we've been talking about this evening. Uh, they have had to actually start recruiting in countries like Brazil and South Africa because the the nationwide lockdown here and the social distancing meant there weren't enough cases in the communities so that, so that those who'd been vaccinated could test out whether they really were immune to coronavirus. So it's been good news for our nation that this lockdown did work, but not so good news for those people trying to conduct a trial for a vaccine that potentially could help the entire world if, if it works. Victoria, thanks very much. Well, a coronavirus outbreak is also being investigated at a call centre in North Lanarkshire, which is used to te handle test and trace calls for NHS England. Scotland's Deputy First Minister said the site had been closed and extensive contact tracing was underway. Our Scotland correspondent, Kieran Jenkins, is in Motherwell now. Kieran. 
Jackie, beyond these buildings is the CITEL call centre building that, as you say, has been closed for cleaning and everyone who works there has been ordered uh, to take a test after eight workers now have tested positive for COVID-19. And it's not just any call centre, uh, it's a call centre being used by contact tracers for England's test and trace system. Now, uh, why is that work happening here in Scotland? Well, in this case, the work's been outsourced to the US company, uh, Cytel, which runs a number of different call centre operations uh, from its building here. So an outbreak in a call centre whose purpose is to try and stop outbreaks. And because we're in Scotland, the response is being managed by the Scottish system. That's called Test and Protect, and that's run more kind of in-house by, in by public health teams. So in the last day or so, we've had contact tracers calling each other. Contact tracers from the Scottish system will have been calling up contact tracers uh, who work here on the English system and tracing their contacts. Here's Scotland's Deputy First Minister. A member of the public or a member of staff uh, contacted public health officials yesterday morning. Um, we would have, our expectation would have been that during the course of yesterday, the various tests that had uh, become positive tests would have been linked together because they were obviously clearly linked to the same workplace. But a member of the uh, of the working uh, of the workforce contacted NHS Lancashire in the first instance. The virus is still out there; it still remains a threat, and of course. If there's a slightest bit of weakness in any of the arrangements that we have in place in any uh, business or institution or, uh, or facility, the virus can find some, some, some space to breathe and to move on. And we've got to avoid that at all possible costs. We're told at least 30 contacts have been identified for tracing linked to this outbreak. Not necessarily people who work here, they could be anywhere in the community. And although case numbers are low in Scotland now, clearly with more and more opening up, there are warning signs here.